Davis steps under center. Gibson and McClendon behind it. Davis with motion by Richard. Will get the ball to McClendon. He leaps. Oh, he doesn't get in. He fumbled the football. Carolina holds. The game is over. And Carolina has won the game. Finley to throw. Over the middle. Intercepted. Wolfuck again. Wolfuck the other way. At the 30. The 40. Wolfuck to midfield. Miles Wolfuck with the pick. The heels on the doorstep of an enormous victory. Left side of the line. Hood standing to Williams' is right. Williams going to throw. One-on-one. Davis has it. Touchdown. Carolina wins. Carolina is the Coastal Division champion. Bernard fields it at the 26. Heading to the far side. Gio at the 35. Gio, he's at the 50. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Gio is going to take it for a touchdown. for the possible win. Snap, spot, kick away, high enough, long enough. It's good! It's good! Carolina has won the game on a 42-yard field goal by freshman Hunter Burr. Good gosh, dirty. This is the Heel Tough Blog Hey guys, and welcome to another edition of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast. It's your host, Anthony Pagnata, with you guys as always. And today, we continue our off-season interview series, and another former Tar Heel stopping by with us today. It is defensive end Hiley Taylor from 2004 to 2007. He was on campus in Chapel Hill, was recruited by John Bunning, and then, of course, finished his career out in his final season under Butch Davis. And the first thing that we had to ask him, of course, uh, we did start with, you know, asking him how his family was doing with everything that was going on with COVID and then sort of transitioned into what the, uh, you know, his career entailed and how he got off to a really solid start out of the gate to his career. Yeah. Yeah. So um, when I was coming out of high school, uh, when I was playing high school, um, I started getting recruited by North Carolina. We, uh, had a playoff game here in Independence, and at the time, a quarterback by the name of Chris Leak um, was the quarterback for Independence. So um, he had a lot of uh, interest, um, a lot of colleges coming to see him. So um, going into that game, um, I got to him quite often. And um, uh, at the time, uh, Gunter Brewer, which is the guy who recruited me, uh, had noticed me. And that following week, I had got my first call from them. And uh, it kind of just uh, things panned out from that point forward. Um, I, you know, received a lot of interest at that point. And um, uh, Carolina was just the first school that to start recruiting me. So that had a lot to do with me uh, choosing them. And, um, you know, despite all the offers I had, one of the things that my dad made me realize is that he wanted me to choose a school that um, in case I, I, you know, I didn't make it to the NFL or I end up getting a serious injury that I couldn't play any longer, what degree um, that I feel like stood out the most and had the most connections. And um, we felt like, you know, you don't see Chapel Hill had that. So um, that's why I chose them. And uh, I chose them as well because I feel I, I, I'm very loyal person and uh you know i love the state of north carolina a lot um so i figured that and i still do think that chapel hill represents uh the whole north carolina state as a whole so so that's why i chose them well you look you come in and and you know you get a chance to, to play early under coach bunning uh you know that you, you weren't a guy that put up a ton of huge stat numbers but uh you know, you were still a guy that kind of fought your way through, you know, the first three years on campus and made the impact that you could at that time. You know, I think one of the things that's important when you look at the landscape of college football nowadays is that you see a lot of guys entering the transfer portal, you know, when they don't get the role that they expect or, or that they were told. You know, how did you kind of keep your spirits high during that time where, you know, you saw some snaps, but you probably weren't playing as much as you were hoping. Thank you. Uh, in your first few years on campus. Yeah, it's actually funny, Anthony. It was kind of vice versa, man. I uh, I was playing as a freshman at 195 pounds, and 
uh, at the time, um, you know, Coach Bunning, um, you know, I kind of thought I was going to get red shirted, but, uh, you know, going and talking to Coach Bunning, he felt that, you know, that I was ready and at the time that, you know, that I can help the team out. So, um, despite missing five, grand, uh, five games my true freshman year, um, you know, I still hold the true freshman stat record there at North Carolina. Um, it's a record that goes on the radar, but it's one that, uh, you know, it says, it, it says a lot and, Kind of my mentality the whole time at Carolina, man, is just that uh, I just I just love to compete, and so uh, I kept my spirits high because, you know, I, I, I always seen us, you know, all the work that we put in with Coach Connors at the time in the weight room, and all the work that we put in, I really really felt like that uh, we, we we had a chance to win a championship despite, you know, the the outside and they stairs and, uh, you know, despite how it looked from the outside looking in, I really, really truly believe that we had what it what it took to get there. And, uh, fortunately, you know, during my time, we wasn't we was, we were able to do that. But uh, I can honestly say, say my last year under Coach Davis, uh, we have, we, we did, we was very instrumental in setting that foundation from, you know, the teams leading there and out. So, um that's that's kind of what I was standing on. Yeah, you're right, though. That that record does fly under the radar. I actually uh, looked at the bio that they have for you online right now and just saw it. I'm, I, I overlooked that. That's my bad on that one. That's no, no, it's all good. Uh, it's all good. I'm, look, well, I think we're all hoping that maybe one of these guys coming in, Keyshawn Silver, Javari Ritzy, a couple of guys down the line, may be able to eventually break that at some point. As they, but uh, it's definitely one of those records that, uh, yeah, probably a lot of people don't know about. But, yeah, I mean, uh, that, that was just a great start. But as you mentioned, you know, you then move on to Coach Davis in your senior year. And, you know, the first thing I, I wanted to ask you, and I've asked a couple of guys this question that kind of went through uh, that same time period as well. You know, what was the biggest difference going from Coach Bunning to Coach Davis, the guy that, you know, had coached in the NFL, had coached and had success at Miami? What, what was the thing that you noticed almost immediately that was different about his coaching style? Um, well, well, Coach Coach Button did a, a very, very great job. I, I would say during his years, it's probably the, the most uh, mentally tough I have been in my life because we, you know, we went through a lot at that time. Um, you know, we had, you know, multiple practices a day. And just kind of his whole mentality was, you know, he stood on mental toughness. And so uh, we was a very mental tough team, and that's why we were able to compete in a lot of games despite being – um, you know, having records of like, you know, four, four and eight and records of such. Like we, I can honestly say we never gave up and he had a lot to do with that because, you know, he wasn't one of those, you know, people that, you know, just, just tuck his, tuck his tail and, and, and go in. So, um, the biggest difference between him and Coach Davis, I would say at the time for me and the, and, and the people that was able to set the foundation, um, was transition. You know, it was kind of, uh, it's a different time. Uh, it was, it was unfortunate because, you know, we felt like, you know, again, you know, like me and my colleagues, especially in the defensive line, we had three different position coaches uh, at college. And that's tough. You know, uh, some people are fortunate to have one coach throughout their career to kind of, you know, learn little nuances. But we was able to adapt a lot. And, and again, that goes a lot on the radar because a lot of teams are spoken about in the Carolina football history. But the class of 2004, I can honestly say, as an artist, I see we don't, you know, we don't gain a lot of respect, but it's okay. That's who we are. But we, we are a huge part into where that program is today. So Coach Davis came in, and uh, you can tell that, you know, he had a lot of experience in the professional level and the collegiate level. And he came in and, uh, you know, he just embraced everybody. You know, he said, whatever you're good at, that's what we're going to use you at. If you're not good at it, you will be sitting on the bench. So that was kind of his mantra the first day going in. And uh, if you was a guy that get after it, he was going to make sure you seen the field. If you didn't, you wasn't going to play. So he came in uh, and immediately would say, hey, we're a championship team. And a lot of guys – you know, mentality at that time was just making it to a bowl. And I can honestly say personally, you know, with some guys on the team, you know, there was someone who was like, no, we're a championship team, you know, uh, despite what it looked like. So I think that had uh, – a lot to do with it, and uh, him coming in and making us compete. He was a huge competitor. He made everybody compete, um, no matter who you were. Uh, and, and Coach Button did the same thing, but uh, Coach Davis, um, you know, he just he came in and just did little, you know, little things different. You know, um, 
you know, one of the biggest things that stand out, one training camp, uh, we had a two-a-day, uh, one of our last two-a-days, instead of practicing that last day, uh, we went to the swimming pool. You know what I mean? So it was little things like that that he interjected that, you know, made us, you know, jump on board quick, which I think was important. Well, you know, look, you talked about some of those guys that were on that defensive line with you. And, you know, I just don't think that a lot of people understand that that how good that defensive line was for you guys. Um, you mm-hmm. know, it kind of set the precedent for some of the guys that would come after you uh, that, of course, would go on and, and, and make it to the NFL level. But, I mean, you talk about, you know, yourself. Uh, you've got Ken, uh, Ken Swan Balmer in there, as well as E.J. Wilson. And even I like Cam Thomas quite a lot uh, that year because of an injury. But, you know, when you go back and look at that defensive line, you know, how special was that group? And, and do you think that kind of set the, the, the tone for uh, those good defensive lines that uh, would define the Butch Davis era over the next couple of years? Yeah, yeah, I do, man. I mean, uh, rest in peace to Coach Blake. But between him and Coach Davis, um, you know, it, it, it kind of, they, you know, they kind of put the weight on our shoulders saying that it starts up front. You know, any football team you're on, whether offensively or defensively, you have that lineman, and the lineman kind of sets the tone. You know, if the if the offensive linemen are basically bulldozing and, and, and basically having their way with the defensive linemen, then that's when you see the scoreboard go up. But vice versa, if you have a, a defensive line that's wrecking havoc, um, then it's going to be a defensive game, low-scoring game, and, and that's when you see your interceptions, your sacks, and, uh, you know, things of that nature. So uh, they were very big on the defensive linemen, uh, starting it up front in the defensive line and uh, kind of setting the tone for the team. So um, when Coach Blake came in, uh, which he came in with Coach Davis, um, you know, he was about speed. You know, whatever he was good at, he was going to do. He knew I was a speed guy. He didn't want me messing too much with the run, even though I didn't mind it. But he utilized what I was good at. He utilized what every single player was good at. And uh, whether that was situation or not, you want to be in the game. And if we needed uh, somebody to get to the quarterback, he was going to put four defensive linemen that are known to get after it and who's who's been winning one-on-ones all week, and that's who's going to be in the game, you know. Or, uh, with the guy stuffing the run, that was going to be the, the four best linemen. So uh, they did a very good job of uh, utilizing, uh, you know, what they had, what to work with, and it was kind of the monster of Davis, you know, uh, whatever, what, when, wherever he came in that, you know, um, he was going to – get the best out of each player and, um, you know, use 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 what he has, so to speak. Um, and so, um, you know, a lot of long and long with, with Coach Blunt as well. But uh, I can say um, and Coach, Dar- uh, Coach Davis there was kind of – the presence was more, the emphasis was more on the defensive lineman, which is why you're seeing, uh, you know, a lot of us come out, uh, you know, in a, a certain range of years and, and get drafted and, and move on to play in the league. Well, that senior year uh, that you had was just amazing. I don't think people realize just how special it was. It ranks up there as one of the best of tar- of the Tar Heel defensive linemen over the past 15 years. Uh, you know, what do you think allowed you to be so successful that senior year? Do you think it was just a mix of, you know, being in, in Coach Davis' system along with the seniority, or was there something else? I would say um... – I would say a little it's a combination of both, a combination of uh, Coach Davis. Um, again, you know, because I was a senior, didn't mean I was going to play. You know, there was a lot of seniors that we had that didn't play. But what I did, like I've always kind of been a a guy that kind of embraces pressure, you know. And I knew it my last year, and my back was against the wall. And, you know, if I didn't do what – I thought I was capable of doing, I wasn't going to make it to the league. And so um, that coming in that last year, uh, you know, it was full bore, you know, at least like any other year. My, but my last year was a year that I didn't, you know, I wasn't played with injuries either. You know, I played through some minor injuries, but my senior year, I, was, I can truly say, um, you know, I didn't have any major injuries, you know, because again, uh, if you look my true freshman year, I'm only, I only played like six or seven games, and I set out five games because I had a fractured femur. So, uh, the following year, uh, I had my knee scope. You know what I mean. So, between that freshman and that that junior year, uh, I had some some major injuries. But my last year, um, you know, thankfully, I didn't have any major injuries. And um, you know, we had some good players, some guys that flew around. And um, you know, we we just went in and, and we was all in with Coach Davis on day one. And so, uh, when you have uh, guys who are willing and buying in to what you're saying. 
it makes everything easier. You know what I mean? It, make, it, it makes uh, practices easier. And it makes the games a lot easier. And so uh, another thing people don't realize, you know, we lost a total of six games my senior year, I think, by a total of 15, 16 points. And so – we easily could have been, you know, a, a eight, a eight and a, eight and four team or a ten and two team, but uh, again, we were, you know, again, not happy with that. But uh, it was unfortunate for guys like myself and Ken Swan and a lot of true freshmen uh, that didn't have another year, uh, you know, to to basically take it to that next next level. Um, so, uh, yeah, man, that's, I contribute a lot of that. Just for a combination of it being my last year and knew that. Uh, you know, if, if if I didn't have any stats or anything, then then it, it was it. You know, I, I, I like a little of me making it to the NFL and playing the football. Beyond that point, was slim to none. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you you had a great year. It put you on the radar, and you end up getting drafted in the seventh round uh, by the Carolina Panthers. And I know that had to be pretty special for you growing up in the state of North Carolina. And, uh, I mean, you know, granted, I mean, when you were, you know, coming up through high school, uh, you know, the Panthers were still kind of establishing themselves in, in the area. But it, I feel like being, you know, from the home state and being able to play for that team was, was probably pretty special for you. What, what was that night like for you when you got that call and you heard that it was from the Carolina Panthers? Um, I mean, it was special. Yeah, it was special, man. And I, I'm going to be fully transparent with you, you know, leading up to that point. Um, you know, my agent was saying other things about getting drafted earlier. So it was a combination of being, you know, a little upset about seeing people go before me that I felt like, you know, that I was better and had a better, you know, career then. And then it was a combination of like, you know what, where well, everything happens for a reason, you know, now, not only am I playing high school and college ball here, now I get to represent the state that I love with all my heart, uh, North Carolina, by playing for the Panthers. So it was super special, man. It was a special moment. And, uh, man, it just kind of it kind of put that whole divine intervention thing into play, man, you know, just about how everything makes a circle, man. And uh, even, you know, uh, I looked at a home video when I was maybe, I think I was like eight years old, man, and uh, I have a, a Carolina Panther shirt on. You know, and so it's just kind of funny how to see how things work work themselves out. But uh, nonetheless, man, it was a great moment, and I was definitely ecstatic uh, to, to be able to represent North Carolina on a professional note. Well, you know, then you go up to Canada uh, in 2013 after bouncing around to a couple of other spots uh, in the NFL, and you end up landing with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, and you get on what ends up being an extremely special team that wins the 101st Grey Cup. And, you know, first of all, what was that experience like for you? And second, you know, there was a guy on that team that a lot of Carolina fans remember, and that was one of the leaders of that team, and Darian Durant. Did you have a close relationship with him? And if you did, how special was that to be able to share, uh, you know, a championship with a former Carolina guy? Yeah, man. First, Saskatchewan was a uh, – it was a great situation, a uh, very good situation. But Saskatchewan is kind of how – the Green Bay Packers is viewed in the league as a publicly owned team, and uh, they kind of use their weather and their stadium to their advantage. And so going up there, man, uh, you can just tell, you know, first getting there, man, we had a lot of good talent, people that, uh, you know, are falling in college, you know, that was coming up, and uh, you can just tell that, that particular team was compiled to win the championship. And so, um, you know, we went in that year. Um, the backs was again against our walls because pre the previous two years the Great Cup was held at the um was held at the stadiums that the team won. You know, so this year the Great Cup was supposed to be held at our stadium. So that whole year it was kinda of this pressure on us where well, we're gonna do the same thing that the previous two teams did. And so we did. Uh, it was a special game. I mean, you had people named Tom Hanks there. I mean, you had a lot of celebrities there at that game. And uh, that was kind of like, wow, you know what I mean? Like, this is – Saskatchewan is, 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 is basically the uh, the face in Canada in terms of CFL football. So that was special. And, of course, you know, having Danny Durant there as well, uh, I was able to play with him my freshman year in college. And uh, seeing him there as well, I mean, it, it made a decision, you know, a lot easier to go up there and play. So, uh, of course, when we were seeing each other, we embraced each other. And uh, throughout the whole year, you know, Darren being Darren, he's a competitor. Uh, in practice, I get to him. And he say, man, I would have slipped that, 
And so it was kind of an ongoing joke uh, between us. You know, I said, man, you ain't changed from uh, – from college because you say the same thing, you know, once you tag them, like, nah, I would have got out of that. And so, uh, it was, it was good, man. It was a breath of fresh air. And, um, yeah, Darren is, uh, he's always been a competitor. Uh, I think he's a sweeper too for the program. Um, he's probably one of the better quarterbacks, I think, of the program has ever seen, uh, and one of the toughest. And so, uh, I think he was able just to show, um, you know, his capable, his capabilities of playing in the CFL and be able to compile. I mean, a great coach as he has. Well, after that, you know, it, it looks like you've gotten yourself into uh, a couple of different business ventures. You know, uh, tell us a little bit about some of these uh, business areas that you've gotten into and, uh, you know, what you've been doing since uh, you, you've uh, put your football career uh, behind you. Yeah, so uh, I own a larger mat uh, right there in Mabin, not too far from Elon University. I, I purchased, me and my brother purchased that in 2013 um, before I went to Canada. Um, and then I uh, have a real estate business uh, where uh, I buy the stretch properties and renovate them. And then uh, recently uh have an inspirational clothing line called Next Play Mentality, uh, which is basically about embracing life's transitions, really good or bad. And so Next Play Mentality was basically coined after a term that is very well known in the athletic field. And it basically means, like, you know, move on from the next play. You know, like, you don't have time to celebrate that play or you don't have time to think about what you did wrong. You got 25 seconds uh, to have amnesia and get the new play and uh, and make it a better play. So uh, I'm kind of bridging the gap between the athletic world and just everyday life because everybody can relate to ups and downs in life, right? And it's, it's not about... Uh, you know, how you get through it, but it's about getting through it, right, and and realize, you know what, it's okay. You know, let's just move on. You know, uh, you know whether it's death in a family, uh, job loss, or uh, reward a new job, or a baby. Like, we all go through different transitions, but it's about embracing it and then moving on to the next. And so, um, yeah, I have a website and all that online, and uh, just here recently, uh, I'm, I'm in the process of trademarking it, so I kind of dialed down on, on, on uh, uh, you know, bringing forth products, but uh, that's on the up and up. So here's going to be a lot more products coming out for it. Yeah, keep an eye on that. It's uh, it is www.nextplaymentality.com. Make sure you guys go and check that out. Uh, yeah, great stuff, Ali. I really appreciate you stopping by with us, man. Uh, giving us a little bit of time to talk about uh, your career uh, here, uh, your career with the Carolina Panthers, and up in Canada, man. Great stuff. Uh, thanks for stopping by with us, and uh, we'll definitely be keeping an eye on everything that you got going on, especially next play mentality, man. I may have to uh, go on there and cut me some of that apparel as well. Uh, definitely oh. around for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Anthony, I appreciate it, man, and uh, go Hills. All right, man. Yeah, thank you so much. We'll uh, hopefully talk to you down the line, man. Best of luck going forward. And, uh, yeah, well, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll get to see an exciting season this year uh, with, uh, you know, a couple other guys that uh, could be once-in-a-generation players that come through Carolina. For sure, for sure. They prime for it. All right, man. Take care. Thank you. All right. You too. Thanks, guys. Right. Bye. So we want to thank Hi Lee for stopping by with us. Really appreciate that. And, uh, guys, again, one of many interviews that we have this offseason, doing a lot of them, just like uh, we did last year during COVID. This year, a little bit different. You know, people are a little bit more busy, so uh, we haven't had as many as we did a year ago, but we're still getting to hear from some of those former guys. Hi Lee, uh, one of the more underrated players, and he is actually in an article that is up on the website right now. You guys can check it out. It is the most underrated Tar Heels of the last 15 years in Tar Heel football. Uh, it's a great article. He uh, is on the list somewhere, either my list, Josh's list, or honorable mention. So make sure you guys go check that out. There's a bunch of other guys on there uh, that you guys probably didn't realize just how good of careers they had. And uh, we went ahead and ranked them. That was on, of course, the last edition of the podcast as well. So you can go back and listen to that. Uh, that was fun because, uh, you know, it was a top five list, but we guessed each other's. We t- tried to take a 
guests at each other because, of course, me and Josh, uh, you know, we've been best friends since sixth grade. Uh, pretty much grew up watching Tar Heel football together and uh, ended up starting the podcast uh, a few years ago. So that's a really interesting addition to the podcast if you want to go back and check that out. We've got the article on the website, which gives you a little bit more in-depth of a description as to why we picked the guys that we did on our list and also points out some of the honorable mention guys that me and him went back and forth on afterwards, after the podcast was over, we were talking about it a little bit. I figured I'd throw some of those other names in there that we were conversating about off the air that you guys didn't get to hear. So uh, make sure you check that out on the website. Of course, we have recruiting updates for you as well. Uh, you know, we got the stock report, uh, you know, kind of just reacting to some of the public news that's out there when it comes to some of these recruits. So you guys can check that out. Uh, there's some really good stuff on there. Uh, we're going to have another one uh, coming out. Uh, should be actually up there tonight, uh, the night that we are posting this. So you guys can go ahead and check that out. We'd really appreciate that. Uh, that'd be uh, really great because there's some really good tidbits in there as well uh, that you guys uh, may have missed, may have missed from some of the other bigger publications that covered a little more in depth than we do. We're keeping you covered as well on that front, trying to give you uh, just a little bit more of an uh, of a look at you know some of those guys and uh, show you uh, you know maybe our opinions of what we think could ultimately end up happening with those guys. Uh, our reactions to me to, to what's going on is, is mainly what those are. So make sure you check it out on the website heeltoughblog.com. You can also check out the podcast there or you can check out the Heel Tough Blog podcast on any of your major podcast platforms, whether it's Spreaker, uh, Pod, uh, Apple Podcasts. I always want to say iTunes because I said that for so long. Uh, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, uh, all these different websites. You can check it out on wherever you listen to your podcast. The Heel Tough Blog podcast is available. Make sure when you go there, you rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast as well. We would greatly appreciate that. Uh, mainly, we want those subscriptions, and, and that's for you guys too. That's the main thing that we want for you guys is that you subscribe so then you can get every edition of the podcast. We're still going to have a few more interviews coming up as we go throughout the summer. And then uh, once we really turn into the month of July, we, we may sprinkle an interview or two in there if we can get some guys free at that time, but that is when we're going to turn our full attention to the upcoming 2021 season of Tar Heel football, one that is expected to carry some of the biggest expectations in recent years. We'll have you guys ready. We're going to do uh, position previews this year on the podcast as well as our normal ones that we do on the website. We're going to discuss each position on the podcast. Normally, we just do the sides of the ball, so we don't really get into some of the nitty-gritty stuff that we're going to get into this year because we have a little bit more time this year. We have, you know, a studio that's going to have scheduled days. And you know what that means as well? That means the video podcast is coming back, that we have the studio back. So make sure that you guys are keeping an eye out for that. That is going to be coming here in the next a uh, couple of weeks, we'll be back in the studio. We'll be back on camera as well. So uh, that'll be great for you guys. We'll have the graphics up on the screen like we did last year. Uh, it, it is going to be very exciting to be able to get back to doing some of that stuff for you. The best place uh, that you can check all of that stuff out is the place where it's all posted at. It's on Facebook. Uh, make sure you go there, like, and follow the Facebook page. Uh, you can do that at the top of the page whenever you search it and click on the page. Just search Heel Tough Blog on uh, Facebook in the search bar, and that'll bring it up for you. And then on Twitter, uh, if you want to follow the Twitter feed, we encourage that as well, at Heel Tough Blog on Twitter. Uh, but when it comes to those video podcasts, whenever we do post the links, which we will, on the page for uh, those those live podcasts that we're going to do on camera, it is going to be on Facebook. So you guys will have to click on the Facebook link to go over and check those out. So uh, just make sure that you're, uh, you're liking that Facebook page. That's the easiest way to do it. If you want to follow us personally on social media, it's me at HTB Anthony. Of course, Josh, who you know is our, uh, our co-host here on the Heel Tough blog podcast also does some of the trench report stuff during the season on the website on the football side of things and handles everything uh, in terms of the basketball side of things when it comes to the four corners podcast and a lot of the in-season stuff as well 
You can follow him at HTB Josh on Twitter. And then, of course, for the guy that will be doing the recruiting podcast, we're going to be having one of those coming up here pretty soon. It is Zach Hubbard on social media at HackZubbard2 to follow him. So that wraps it up for this edition of the podcast. want to thank Hiley Taylor for stopping by. want to thank you guys for listening. And as always, go Tar Heels! <laughs>